Hello and welcome to Desperate Housewives Season 2. To kick things off, a few general things about Season 2. First of all, it was not as critically acclaimed as the first season. It was still highly rated though, so people watched it even though it was going downhill. We will talk about what went wrong, but the main thing is the weakness of the overall mystery of season two for a variety of reasons. First, mechanically, it just doesn't work as well to bring all the storylines together like season one did. So if you'll remember in season one, with Mary Alice and the note, pretty much every character at some point had some significant clue or discovered some significant clue. Um, so it's not only Mary Alice, but also Martha Huber. Mike is crucial to figuring out everything that happened in season one. The way that Mike is tied in so wonderfully with the Youngs, despite being a new person to the neighborhood, really makes even characters who are outsiders feel like they've been part of the story the whole time. Season one is also filled with fantastic subplots. Aside from the romance plot lines that go on, there is just a lot happening. There is Andrew Vandekamp accidentally killing a woman and also Rex being poisoned by George. Those are two huge Bree storylines that have only begun to be explored in season one. And it balances each character's protagonism and antagonism pretty well. Such as Carlos and Gabby. They are so toxic. Gabby slept with another young man who is also not of age yet. Very bad. Carlos, well, he fucked with Gabby's birth control. Also very bad. However, they come together in such a beautiful way that it's clear that their love for each other overcomes all of the downsides about them so you can still sort of root for them and that's something you find in pretty much all of the characters consistently right season two is just upsetting in a lot of ways a lot of people had problems with season two as i mentioned this includes i read in my research vanessa williams who later joins the cast as one of the leading ladies of the show who stopped watching season two because of the very racist main mystery plot line and i do not blame her it is incredibly uncomfortable to watch it's not it's just bad do i like season two some of it but some plot lines are so uncomfortable to watch that i don't really find myself wanting to re-watch season two um, I did for this video, but usually when I'm like watching with a friend for the first time, we sit there in discomfort and are like, oh, wow, let's just go ahead and jump into season two. Season two, episode one. The season premiere was viewed by 28 million people and it was the highest viewed episode of the season. Generally speaking, the season two reviews were pretty mixed. It's, pr it's kind of messy out here. And I will dig into that as we go on. Let's start with the introduction of our new leading lady for the season. This is Betty Applewhite. She is portrayed by the amazing Alfre Woodard. She actually first appears in the episode before the season one finale. She and her son Matthew move into Wisteria Lane. They move in. In the middle of the night and it's kind of weird like why are these people moving in, in the middle of the night notably the applewhites are the first black family to move into wisteria lane very exciting we're becoming a little more diverse although it's still not looking great out here it only took you know 21 episodes but we did it <laughs> so good job in the season one finale betty and matthew are just moving in getting settled into their home and edie stops by she is the real estate agent who sold them the home and she stops by she wants to just like do a quick check around the house make sure everything's okay make sure that they're settling in okay betty applewhite makes it very clear she does not want edie in her home which makes edie and the audience begin to believe that maybe Betty is hiding some sort of secret. In the season two premiere, Brie and Danielle go over to introduce themselves to the Applewhites. Danielle is kind of interested in Matthew already. Um, they're a little flirty, but nothing inappropriate in front of their mothers. Brie and Danielle share that Rex recently passed away, and Matthew says to Danielle that he gets it because he also lost his father recently. And then the Vandekamps leave, and Betty says to Matthew, why would you lie about that? 
Why would you just make that up? And Matthew explains that it might be a good cover story for them. Right away, they are lying about possibly why they're there. At least Matthew is. Um, I want to note super early on that I love the kind of friendship that Betty and Bree develop. It kind of gets fucked up as the season goes on, but unfortunately most of her storylines are only connected to her own storylines and sometimes to Brie, but it's like Brie's B plot in the season, maybe even C plot, depending on your perspective on things. So also in this episode, Brie reveals to the other ladies on the lane that Rex passed away and Rex's mother shows up. She is devastated by the loss. You may recall from last season, we left off with Zach holding Susan hostage at gunpoint at Mike's house, and then Mike walks in, and that's where the season ended. So this time we pick up at Mike's. Susan tackles Zach to get the gun away from him to save Mike, and she's taken to the hospital with minor injuries. Mike tells the police he does not want to file a police report, and he also lies about what happened behind Susan's back, but Julie overhears this. So Julie tells her mom that Mike is not being honest about what happened. It seems like Mike is trying to protect Zach rather than protect Susan and how she feels about what just happened. Once Julie explains to Susan the lie that Mike told, Susan confronts Mike, and Mike explains that he knows Zach is a good kid. He also tells Susan that it was Mary Alice that killed Deirdre. And then they're interrupted when Mike gets a phone call from the police saying that they have found Zach's body and they need him to come in and identify it. So Mike and Susan go. It is not Zach, but Mike is very, very upset about the whole thing. Everything suddenly clicks for Susan and she realizes that Mike is Zach's biological father. Mike confirms this to her and it's clear that Mike plans to pursue a relationship with Zach. He wants to be around, if not as his dad, then at least as someone who has his back because Paul, you know, he's fucking around. <laughs> Susan does not want to spend any time around Zach because she is traumatized by what happened at Mike's house. So she tells Mike that since Zach is going to be around, he cannot move in with her and the relationship kind of comes to an end there. Over in the Scavo household, Lynette has a job interview, but Tom throws out his back, so Lynette is forced to take Penny with her to the interview. She is terrified that she's not going to get the job because no one wants to hire someone who's too busy with their kid to actually do the job, according to, like, the prospective bosses, you know? And the boss is actually really impressed by Lynette's ability to multitask because she ends up, like, having to change Penny's diaper in the middle of the meeting, but she gets the job. So she's, she's in her girl boss era, and we love to see it. And finally, mystery-wise, sometimes for season two, I will incorporate the mystery at the end if it happens at the end of the episode. But if it's just clues we get throughout the episode, I'll probably leave it with Betty's storyline for the episode. Um, it just depends how it feels organically, just like how I did with the Paul, Mary Alice, Zach stuff in season one. At the end of the episode... We have Matthew and Betty going down into the basement. Betty says, I'll take the tray, you take the gun. She brings a tray of food down into the basement and opens up a heavy locked door and goes inside to leave the food for someone who is being held captive. We don't see who this is, um, but we do see the hand of a black man who has been shackled to the wall. Um, it's incredibly disturbing, and I have a lot to say about this, but I'm going to wait until the character is revealed because it all connects to my overall thoughts. So just know that's happened, and it's like, okay, they do have a secret after all. <laughs> cool. I'm fucking sweating. All right, episode two. Let's dive right into Betty's storyline. First, we see Betty and Matthew discussing that the secret person being held in their basement is there because he's being punished for something. We're not given any clues as to what this person may have done or who this person is yet. Betty then goes to a psychiatrist and she tells them that she's having a really hard time sleeping. She opens up about her past in which her abusive ex-husband murdered their young child who was eight months old. 
She says that this trauma has been keeping her awake and she can't sleep, so the doctor prescribes her a sleeping medication. We then see Betty putting some of the sleeping medication into the food that she's taking down for the person in the basement, and Matthew installs a second lock on the door. For the Scavos, Tom is really struggling as a stay-at-home dad. He is just in over his head. The place is a disaster, but he says he has a system. Don't worry. He has a system, but the place is a mess, and Lynette is a little bit of a control freak, and she does not like mess. So this leads to a little bit of conflict between them, and that's the heart of the episode. For Brie, she is still reeling from her husband's death and the irritating presence of her mother-in-law. The insurance company, who is going to pay out Rex's life insurance, begins to suspect that something weird happened uh, with his death, and they are suspicious, so they need to investigate the death further. And also, George stops by to invite Brie out to do something because she's been stuck in her house since her husband died. Okay, and then we have a brief update on Susan. In this episode, we discover that Carl is sleeping with Edie. They did have that one little date in mid-season one, but they are together now. Edie and Susan have this big argument about it, and then Susan accidentally hits her with her car. If I remember correctly, Edie is on roller skates, so it really is an accident, and it's this whole messy thing where, like, Edie's holding on to the side of her car while Susan is trying to drive through the neighborhood. Carl then tells Susan that he and Edie are going to move in together, so things are pretty serious. Season two, episode three. Let's start again with the Applewhites. So the young man who is being held in the basement breaks out and, for lack of a better phrase, attacks Betty and Matthew. During all of this, Susan stops on by the Apple White House, knocks on the front door, and when Betty opens the door, she has blood on her white shirt. She explains that away when she gets a confused look from Susan, as it being cherry pie filling. Susan asks Betty if she will help her learn some piano for this talent show family thing that Julie is in with Edie the next week, right? One thing we do get to learn about Betty is that she used to be a concert pianist. That's kind of fun. That's cool. I'm glad she like has some sort of hobby besides her main mystery plot. They tried for like two seconds to flesh her out. Susan also wonders if everything is okay because she's been hearing a weird pounding sound coming from the basement. And Betty says, oh yeah, it's just my son, Matthew. He plays music really loud. And also he's like working on fixing the dryer and also like she just has all these excuses for it. But what's weird to me about this moment is Susan can hear that banging from their basement, but can't hear the physical altercation happening on the main floor of their house while she is like walking up the porch. Let's jump over to Brie now. So Brie finally asks her mother-in-law when she's leaving because she is sick of seeing her. At the cemetery where Brie goes to visit Rex's grave, she finds that his body has been exhumed. So she talks to the detective to find out why and he refuses to give her any details of the case at all. Um, I wanna note here that ever since Rex's death, Brie has only been wearing black which I love. Um, it's such a great detail on her character from the costume team. So I just wanted to make sure I made a note of that. It becomes clear now to the Vandekamp kids that something suspicious happened with Rex's death and Danielle begins to suspect that Brie is the one who killed Rex. And Andrew insists that it was not Brie because she's too gutless to have done something like that. Brie gets interviewed by detectives and she has to do a polygraph test and during the polygraph test, she is asked all kinds of basic things. And if she had anything to do with Rex's death, she says no. She passes that part of the polygraph. And then they ask her if she knows George Williams. And she says yes. And they end up asking her if she's in love with George Williams. And she says no. And then the test results indicate that she's lying we then see George Williams taking the same polygraph test, and he is asked if he had anything to do with Rex's death. He says no, and we as the audience know this is a complete lie. He is the one who murdered Rex, but his polygraph results are clean, and Mary Alice has a wonderful voiceover line at this moment where she says, you start by lying to yourself. George? What the fuck, man? 
Like he just doesn't think he did anything wrong. I, there's a lot of really upsetting characters in the show who have like no moral compass or regret for awful things they've done. George is creepy as fuck. Like out of all of the antagonists on the series, I would venture to say George is the scariest out of all of them. At least the ones that I can remember. Um, in later seasons, five, six, seven, I don't recall those main storylines as much, so forgive me. But George, what the fuck, dude? Yeah, okay, I need to talk about something else now. Gabby discovers that John is having an affair with another housewife. She confronts him because she is upset that he has moved on from her so quickly. There's this fantastic line that Gabby has. Oh my god, I can't believe I almost left my husband for someone who calls me Mrs. Solis. John has always only referred to her as Mrs. Solis. They will finish having sex and he will say, oh, that was great, Mrs. Solis. And when he proposed, he said, Mrs. Solis, will you marry me? It just really drives home how upsetting their whole thing is. Anyway, Gabby then apologizes to Carlos for the affair and for complicating things in their marriage so much. Finally, Lynette has started her new job. She's already had a few kind of scheduling logistical issues with her kids because Parker wants her to be there to bring him to his first day at his new school. A few other little things come up and this is very upsetting to Nina, Lynette's boss. Um, Lynette explains like, I'm a mom, it's just how it is. Like I don't have control over these things all the time that I still am obligated to follow through on. And Nina basically tells her, it was your decision to have a kid, so why is it my problem now? And like, I get where both of them are coming from, you know? But like, what? <laughs> Girl, the problem here is not Lynette or Nina so much as work culture in America. But I don't think Desperate Housewives is ready to take on that kind of discussion. So we'll just say it's a mild conflict between the two women, and that's that. Season 2, Episode 4. Brie invites George over for dinner, and George starts trying to talk Brie into sending Andrew to a rehabilitation camp again. Um, they're at Andrew's swim meet, and George tries to kiss Brie, and she does not want to kiss him, and he basically, like, forces his lips on her. It's really not pleasant and andrew beats him up and i gotta say in this one situation i don't think andrew did anything so bad i would i would have also liked to beat up george williams in the scavo household parker is struggling with his mother being gone and this new change in their household dynamic he has an imaginary friend named mrs mulberry lynette does not want to entertain it at first, but then she kind of has to entertain it. Mrs. Mulberry ends up getting hit by a garbage truck. <laughs> um, and Tom's like, oh, well, maybe we can help her. And then it's like, no, Tom, she's gone. And Parker is devastated. She has a meltdown later where she thinks she's a terrible mom because her son's imaginary friend died because of her. It's a wonderful Lynette scene and Lynette and Tom scene. Out of all of season two, this is in my top five Lynette scenes. I love it. Honestly, the whole series, this is a top five Lynette scene. As you'll recall, it was thought that Zach was dead. That's because he is missing. He like ran off after the whole altercation in Mike's house. He's still missing. So Edie knows now that Zach is Mike's son and that Susan is helping Mike look for Zach. Susan finds Zach and... He tells her that Paul is alive, Mike did not kill Paul, everything is okay. He starts talking about Julie again and showing interest in seeing and speaking to Julie, which Susan does not want, especially after what happened at Mike's house. So she gives him some money to go to Utah, and that's where he seems to want to go. Susan does it so he will leave Julie alone, but unfortunately this also means giving him money to get out of Mike's life. Season 2, Episode 5. Betty and Matthew are watching the news and there is a news story about a murder of a young woman in Chicago named Melanie Foster. On the news, they announced that they have made an arrest in the case of her assault and murder. And Betty and Matthew say they're in the clear now. 
Betty then proceeds to write and send a letter to the Chicago Police Department stating that they have the wrong guy. Finally learn the identity of the young man being held in the basement. His name is Caleb and he is Matthew's brother and Betty's other son. Betty says that he cannot be let out until he accepts responsibility for what he did. It is not said explicitly what he did, but based on the presence of the news, we can assume that he had something to do with Melanie Foster. I also want to note that in this episode, we really get a good sense of who Caleb is. I don't mean like as an individual, but as a piece of the mechanics of this story of season two of Desperate Housewives. So we learn that Caleb is intellectually disabled and seeing a young black man who is intellectually disabled being shackled and held in a basement. I don't know how there weren't more alarm bells going off uh, in the writer's room. It gets worse later. Now, as we start to delve a little bit more into all the intricacies of the Applewhite plotline, um, a few things are important to know. First of all, in my research, I read that there were two white women who were offered the role and in talks to play the role of Betty Applewhite before I went to Alfre Woodard. So it's not necessarily that the writers sat down and decided that they were going to give us all of these visual images and upsetting storylines the first time they had a black family move on to Wisteria Lane. However, as a team of writers and as a showrunner and studio, you know, as a creative team, you do have a responsibility to have some critical thinking and understand that there are certain historical tropes that have been used in literature and art and theater and film and television for far too long. There are just so many things about the Applewhite storyline in general that were very unnecessary and leads to putting tropes on the screen that are not there for the sake of commenting on the discomfort of those visuals. I'm not going to give it that kind of credit. Like, that is not what's happening here. It's just lazy. Yeah, there are a few other things later on in the season that really just, like, add one thing after another on top of this that makes it such an inappropriate storyline. That's where I'll leave the discussion for this episode. But I wanted to kind of get the ball rolling on this because it is important. It would be irresponsible of me not to address this kind of thing in a video like this, which is meant to dissect all of the storylines of the show. Like, I can't not touch on it because when season two is talked about in pop culture, and among my friends who watch the show, whether they're a first time viewer or watched it as a teenager like I did, and you think of The Ming Mystery season two, it's a lot of confusion and bewilderment at how this made it to the screen in the way that it did. Let's talk about Brie now. So Andrew is sent back to Camp Hennessy for a very fresher course following beating up George. The detective decides to give Bree the note that says, I forgive you. There's a plane. Hold on. The detective decides to give Bree the I forgive you note that Rex wrote. And she is devastated to learn that Rex somehow thought that she had done this to him. So in this episode, when Bree visits his grave again, she has this gorgeous scene where she yells at him she has done nothing that she needs to be forgiven for honestly like two episodes ago we got that amazing lynette scene where she's in bed crying with tom this is like Bree's scene that's equivalent to that of just it's gorgeous i can't it's beautiful work for marcia cross so let's give it up for marcia thank god in this episode we have something that's a little more lighthearted. we have this wonderful lynette storyline Basically, her boss is a bitch. Lynette is like, you just need to get out and have a little fun and let loose for a little while. Like, you are such a workaholic. We need to go hit the bar. And her boss is like, yeah, okay, sure. So they go out. Lynette's boss has an amazing time. And so she wants to go out with Lynette all the time. She goes with it because it's, it's making Nina treat her way better around the office. After a few nights, she is 
fucking sick of it. So she decides, quote, the time has come to declare a war on independence. And Lynette goes into the bathroom and she takes off her button up and puts on a vest instead and she struts out onto the dance floor. It is one of the most iconic Lynette scenes of the entire series. So that's mother, like, I don't know what else to say. I have some things I would like to say, but I'm not going to say because this is a professional video, you guys. <laughs> Just know I love this scene a lot for a variety of reasons. Okay, moving on to season two, episode six. Bree gets hives while making out with George because he's a sick, sick man. I would get hives just looking him in the eye. I'm not going to lie. She tells her therapist about it, and George gives Bree a quote antihistamine to help with the hives. Um, but basically, George has just drugged her, and uh, he like leads her out of the restaurant, and she's clearly a drunk be drugged and she's just not with it and no one fucking stops them you would think that brie would know someone at this restaurant who would go over to her and be like girl are you okay are you okay girl because <laughs> this is not <laughs> um yeah she's really drunk so then george um guilts her into sleeping with him <sighs> yeah it's so uh, george assaults brie basically um uh huh. But don't worry. There's not only one terrible, terrible man who deserves death here because Paul Young returns in this episode alive and well. Paul mentions to Mike that Susan told him she knows where Zach is. And Mike is very upset by this because this whole time he has thought that Susan was not able to find Zach. But remember, Susan gave Zach money to go to Utah so he'd stay away from Julie. But now the truth has come out to Mike here. And she is crying and she's like begging for Mike's forgiveness and like, please just like tell me how to fix it. And all the girls go to comfort Susan and then Susan and Mike break up again. I try for the most part not to like abuse the lines and add more than one line if the plot is basically the same, but I ended up putting three separate Mike and Susan romance lines here just to represent the number of times that they break up and get back together and break up. Oh, like it's a lot. It's it's very fascinating to me because I know a lot of people who are really invested in in straight ships are all about the will they won't they and like the slow burn. But Mike and Susan are not that at, at all. They are just like, a, well, they will and now they won't. And then they will and now they won't. And this goes on for a long fucking time. Just wait till we get to season three because every time I start talking about Susan, I'm going to want to, I don't know. I need to go watch the Lynette scene again. Every time I talk about Susan, I'm going to have to watch Lynette dancing on a bar again in her vest. Thank you. Episode 7, let's go. We'll start off with the Apple Whites. In this episode, Betty tries to talk to Caleb about what happened with Melanie Foster. And she tries to explain to him why what happened was so awful. With Betty saying, no one deserves to die like that. At this point, we do have official confirmation that Melanie Foster, pictured here, is dead. So I will do the honors. And just like that, we have death number five. Five? Six. Death number six. Additionally, in this episode, Caleb escapes the basement again because the door isn't secured all the way. And this time, instead of just going upstairs like he did a few episodes ago. He leaves the house. While Matthew is looking for Caleb out in the neighborhood, he goes into the backyard of the Vandekamps. Danielle is back there sunbathing and asks what he's doing there. He has to cover, so he decides to say that he came over to ask her out, and Danielle happily agrees. And now for Bree's storyline in this episode, we have a simple three-act structure here. First, George proposes to Bree. And his mom is watching, so Brie says yes. Brie talks to Dr. Goldfein, her therapist, about the engagement and explains, like, it's not really something she's ready for. So she then goes and talks to George and says that she got some good advice from her therapist who suggests that they stretch out their engagement a little while and 
really make sure it's what they want to do. Act three, Dr. Goldfine is out on a run. George throws him off the bridge. Curtain. I swear to fucking God, I have nightmares about this man. And I have some excellent news for you, okay? So I printed all these photos at my local Dwayne Reed. I forgot to triple check all of my prints to make sure I had one of each character. Turns out I accidentally printed two Georges. It's really upsetting to me. And so this George has just been sitting by my TV for like a week now, fucking staring at me. I mean, look at that face. The actor is a great actor, okay? It's not, uh, this is George's stare. This isn't the actor's stare. This is George that I'm talking about here. And he scares me. And he's been sitting there staring at me and my roommate for like a week. When the time comes, I'm gonna burn it. I can't wait. I'm gonna burn it. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Now that I've shaken it off with a little giggle, time to talk about Gabby in this episode. Okay, now it's no longer silly, so I'm gonna put on my serious face. Caleb has snuck into Gabby's house. He does not touch anything. He doesn't even say anything to her. It, there's no threat there, but of course someone is in her house who she's never seen before, so she starts to run away from him. And while doing so, she falls down the stairs. He still doesn't touch her or say anything. He just leaves. The episode ends with Gabby in an ambulance holding a picture of her ultrasound and crying. And Mary Alice's voiceover line at the conclusion of the episode indicates that Gabby miscarries. Episode 8, we're going to start off with Brie. Brie is pissed because George has put an announcement of their engagement in the local newspaper. And he didn't ask Brie for permission before doing this. She really did not want anyone to know about their engagement, let alone, like, the general public. I mean, her friends don't even know that she's engaged. She doesn't want to be engaged. A woman who saw the announcement in the newspaper stops by Bree's house to warn her. She tells her that she was also engaged to George at one point and that he was incredibly abusive to her. Bree says that she doesn't believe her and she throws her out. But as soon as that door is closed and she's alone, Bree is clearly very nervous about what she's gotten herself into. Bree decides to tell George about the visit and George insists that the woman is just crazy. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She's so crazy. He shows her on his computer at the pharmacy the woman's profile in which she has mental health related medications and then as soon as Bree is like oh okay and leaves he fixes the profile to put the proper name back in like this wasn't even the lady's profile and even if it were like if she's on an SSRI like George is still an asshole you know like <laughs> I don't really know what he was trying to do there and I'm pretty sure he broke um some HIPAA rules there right like I don't think as a pharmacist you can show other people the profiles so I'm just saying Maybe I'm built different, but if you should not be showing her anyone that stuff. But that's like the least of the fucked up stuff George does. So while at this dinner thing, Bree dances with another man so she can get away from George. George gets incredibly jealous. Now earlier at the pharmacy, he noticed she wasn't wearing the engagement ring and he made her put it on. And then as soon as she was out of his line of sight, she took it back off and hid it. It's so nasty. I fucking free her, man. So at this dinner thing, when she's dancing with someone else, George tries to force Brie to put the ring on again because, again, she's not wearing it, but she refuses. And because he is being so pushy with her, she breaks off the engagement then and there. Gabby has a pretty nice episode. So she is recovering from her miscarriage and it's more mentally taxing on her than she thought it would be um, because, I mean, she didn't want to have a baby, period. And when she got pregnant, she was not happy about it, of course. So now she is surprised that she is feeling grief and she's really not doing all that well. And then a man shows up at her house and drives her out and he claims to be a friend of Carlos from prison. Then she like gets in the car with him and the doors are like locked. She can't open them from the inside. Like something's gone wrong and she's starting to panic. But it turns out he just wants to take her to the park to release a balloon for the child that she lost. It's pretty beautiful. 
Eva Longoria is absolutely capable of handling a really wide range of these Gabby storylines, and it's really nice that starting in season two, we get to see her be a little bit more fleshed out. There's a few scenes in season two that, in my opinion, are the most depth we ever get from Gabby, at least in the first half of the series. I haven't watched seasons five through eight again yet, so I don't want to speak on any of that, but for the first half of the series, there's some beautiful Gabby stuff in season two. We also start this Susan storyline this episode. It's not super important, so like I didn't even put it on the wall, but I just want to mention it so that Susan is mentioned more than her struggles with Mike, because trust me, Susan finds so many plot lines to be annoying in. Um, this time, she finds out that her mother has been lying to her about who her father is. Susan never knew her father. And that her real father was married when she got pregnant and also her mother's boss. So Susan sets out on this journey to find him and try and have some sort of relationship with him. And finally, at the end of the episode, Mike finds Caleb wandering around the neighborhood and he recognizes him from Gabby's description in the police sketch. So Gabby is able to confirm that yes, that is the man who broke into her house and he is arrested. He's arrested, he's hauled into a police car and the Applewhites stand there on their porch like with all the other neighbors all you know, staring at the situation happening and they just do nothing. Like they pretend they don't know him. Although Betty does like shush him at one point, which is like, girl, if you're trying to like lay low. Yeah. Season two, episode nine. George shows up at Bree's asking for forgiveness. He has a radio over his head and he starts singing to her. I literally am like developing a migraine just talking about George this much. Bree goes upstairs and grabs a rifle and shoots at him. <laughs> like so true of her, honestly. Bree also visits Dr. Goldfine. He's recovering in the hospital from being thrown off the bridge. And he tells her that the man who pushed him has a blue bike. Um, she knows George owns a blue bike. So she calls the police to inform them that he may have been the attacker. Bria is really starting to realize just how deep she is with this man. Like this is now an incredibly dangerous situation. Like the loss of control she has in this situation is it's terrifying. So getting to have a few of these scenes where she is taking some of that control back, doing what she has to do is really good and enjoyable to watch. It really makes us root for her. It also keeps us from going too far into like psychological thriller slash horror film territory with George because what the f actual fuck? When George gets home, he discovers that the police have raided his home and are looking through his stuff. So he flees. And then he shows up to a hotel where Bree is part of this charity event. He has a letter sent down to Bree, uh, basically inviting her upstairs. After Bree reads it and she's trying to decide what to do, she gets a phone call from the police saying George was responsible for Rex's death. I don't know, Marsha Cross is really killing it this season. There's a lot of things falling apart this season, but I'll tell you, Marsha Cross is still putting in the damn work, okay? She is showing up. <laughs> she is doing her job. And I would like to note that she wears this white dress to the charity event, and it is the first time she wears anything other than black after Rex's death. Once again, costume team, wow, wow, I'll... Bree goes upstairs in the hotel to see him, and he has taken a bunch of pills. He thinks Bree just blames him for Dr. Goldfine. He doesn't realize that Bree knows about Rex, too. So he plans to manipulate her into forgiving him, and he's hoping to use the fact that he took all these pills and needs help now and is like having a crisis to um, get her back on his side. He desperately wants Bree to save him in this moment. But Bree just sits down. She does not call an ambulance. Ambulance. She does not call for help and she watches him die. Oh, he died? Oh, you know what it's time for now. I've returned with my 89 cent plate from Target. Y'all know the ones that scratch really good, but they're classics to me. Okay, we're gonna need a little more fire. There's a smoke alarm right above me. Maybe we'll cut it instead. <laughs> Cause I don't really want to bog my neighbors.
Please do not attempt that at home. Thank you. I'm not liable for any harm or injury caused by burning photos of George Williams from Desperate Housewives. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, we have two more characters to talk about in this episode. First, Gabby. I always like to point at the characters just in case you forgot who they were. So Carlos gets paroled early from prison thanks to a little help from this Catholic church who really believes in rehabilitation and in getting people back into the world to do good things. He got out thanks to this nun named Sister Mary Bernard who turns out to be cute. So Gabby is not pleased. Sister Mary Bernard refuses to back off. She really thinks that she can save Carlos and she thinks Gabby is really bad for him. Um, she wants them to break up. We also have a little update on Susan's father situation. So she has tracked down the man who is her biological father and she's spoken to him. The man has absolutely no interest in knowing Susan, which leaves her heartbroken. Season two, episode 10, Caleb is being held in a mental health facility until he can be identified. Um, there's also this dude who is some sort of PI who is looking for Caleb, this middle-aged white guy we've never seen before, as far as I can remember. Betty gets into the mental health facility by saying she's there to play piano for the patients. Um, and she's there for spiritual purposes, you know, as a member of the church to be there to provide for the patients. While she's playing, Matthew is also there and he is looking around um, trying to find Caleb. He does track him down. Matthew helps Caleb sneak out of the hospital. Um, the PI dude is there and he is dressed up like a nurse and he catches them walking out together. He also sees Betty with Caleb so he knows that something is up. Okay. On to Brie. The police continue to investigate George after his death. They find some really fucked up stuff in his house. So they find some of Brie's lingerie. They find these mannequins that are made to look like Brie. One of the worst things about this is that when the police are like raiding the house and taking evidence, they're walking all this stuff right past a big group of like reporters and stuff. So it's not even private. Like, this is all now public knowledge. This man had a fucking Brie shrine in this household. It's literally like the teacher from iCarly with her Randy Jackson closet, but for Brie. Brie tells the ladies about what happened with George, and then Andrew gets home from Camp Hennessy. Andrew finds out that George was the one who killed Rex, and Andrew blames Brie for letting herself get close to George at all. He thinks that his father was murdered because of Brie. And remember, Andrew has been blaming Brie for everything since literally episode two. Andrew says that one day Brie will slip up and he will have something to hold against her. We'll put a pin in that. Brie makes an appointment with a therapist for the whole family in hopes that it will help them move forward. Good for her. Um, Andrew is still pissed. So Brie ends up telling Andrew that she was there when Rex killed himself. Okay, I want to point a little thing out on the wall real quick. So I gave um, Brie and George a red line for murder. Brie did not murder George, but I decided to put red there because technically she could have intervened if she'd wanted to. I don't think she should have, but I think as far as Bree's like moral compass goes, it's like her fault he's dead. And because she does tell Andrew that she was there when he died as a way to kind of show that she took power back, I wanted to denote the um, importance of that particular event in the plot by using a red line because red lines are not very common as you can see and I, there's not really any other line that fit like there's no complicit in death color i don't have that i only have eight colors so i hope you will all forgive me for making that judgment call okay a few things with gabby this episode gabby and carlos are fighting more and more because carlos is spending a bunch of time with sister mary bernard um doing charity work and stuff gabby desperately wants to get rid of sister mary bernard so she finds out the church is hoping to take a mission trip to botswana she gives them eight thousand dollars to fund the trip and then carlos tells gabby that he will be going with sister mary bernard to botswana however he can't go because gabby sabotages the pre travel vaccines she doesn't tell the doctor that he has an egg allergy so he has this really severe allergic reaction and can't go on the trip this episode zach comes back 
he and Paul hug. They reunite. It's actually a very sweet moment between the two of them. I have very complex feelings towards the young family, particularly Paul. Zach is just kind of caught up in the middle of all this stuff and like you just need some help. But this kind of represents the end of this season 2A plot between Zach and Paul. And finally in this episode, we have one update on Susan, and it brings us one of the most iconic Susan episodes of the entire series, if I do say so myself. Susan's biological father is still married. When she tells him that he's her father, he has a heart attack. She is the one who calls and gets him to the hospital. She visits him in the hospital. That's where she meets his wife. Um, and because his wife sees the two of them talking and clearly they know each other, She's not just some stranger who brought her to the hospital. She has the motivation to go spray paint something on Susan's garage door. This screenshot goes right up there in the Hall of Fame with the uh, screenshot from Black Swan where Nina's looking in the mirror and there's whore written in red lipstick. Season 2, episode 11. Betty comments that they must have termites because the stairs are rotting beneath their feet. The stairs down to the basement, that is. Remember the PI guy from the hospital? He is in the neighborhood scoping things out, and Edie sees him sitting there staring at the Applewhite's house. So she confronts him, asks what's going on, and he claims to be an appraiser, and he's checking out the neighborhood. Edie threatens him and says this is her turf and he needs to leave. A little later on, the man breaks into the Applewhite house when Betty and Matthew are gone. He walks down the stairs and he knocks Caleb unconscious. The man then tries to pull Caleb and get him upstairs. On the way, he falls through one of the rotting floorboards. When he falls, he also accidentally fires his revolver, which results in his death. Caleb is now free because he was let out by this man and the man is dead. So he is sitting, waiting upstairs when the Apple Whites get home. And Caleb says, I didn't do it. And then Matthew and Betty find the dead body. And Betty comments, sometimes you just have to laugh. Um, anyways, Matthew and Betty hide the body in the trunk of his car. So remember, he drove his own car there. It's parked right outside the Apple White House, but um, they hide his body in the trunk of his car. I also want to note, just so it doesn't get lost anywhere in the plot, his death was indeed accidental. He fell on the stairs and the gun discharged and that's what killed him. So Andrew is starting to look for a way to get emancipated. He wants to blackmail her somehow using some some intricate law that Bree won't know about. So Bree hires Carl, who is a lawyer, to have him talk to Andrew about the situation. This is when Andrew makes a comment about Bree drinking a lot of wine before bed. Okay, over in Gabby and Lynetteville, um, there's some fighting this episode. So Gabby, quote, on behalf of all cheerleaders, kisses Tom on the lips. They are basically having this conversation about how Tom didn't really get girls in high school. Um, and since Gabby was like a popular one or now seems like she would be a popular one, she kisses Tom. Lynette is not pleased that this happened. And Brie tells Lynette accidentally about Gabby's affair. And she is like, oh, well, given the affair, I can see why you're so upset. And Lynette is like, what are you talking about? So this is when Lynette finds out that Gabby had an affair with John Rowland, who, again, is 17. Um, one of the things Tom says in this episode is that he's always had asexual magnetism. And my roommate laughed a lot at that line and was like, yeah, you do, Tom. I'm sure there are plenty of viewers that feel the same way. So if that's one of you, then congratulations. Um, for having this Tom Dilf moment. I'm happy for you. So Lynette and Gabby do end up making up, but Gabby still doesn't understand why what she did was wrong, which is what Lynette is more upset about at this point. So Lynette then kisses Carlos to show Gabby exactly what she means by this jealousy. And that makes Gabby understand. And then Carlos stops by Lynette's and basically shoots his shot with her. It probably goes without saying, but Lynette turns him down. We have a few things with Mike and Paul. So they get into a fight because Mike is hanging out so much with Zach and Paul wants him to stay away from his son. 
they are fighting like crazy. It's a physical altercation. So Susan um, is in her car and because of their fight, she swerves and she hits the car outside the Applewhite's house. So the trunk pops open and the whole street discovers there is a dead body in the trunk. Edie says that she begins to suspect something weird is going on with the Applewhites. And Betty says that now she is really starting to worry because not only has the whole neighborhood just seen that there's a dead body right outside their house, but also because of this random PI who, assuming he was looking for something to do with the Melanie Foster case or maybe the note sent to the Chicago police, um, he managed to find them pretty damn fast. So this is like, it's Jova for them. So that's what raises the stakes going into the following episodes for Betty. In the ending montage of this episode, we see Edie and Carl sleeping together. I just wanted to throw that out there to remind us they are a thing. And finally, for Susan, Zach stops by and tells Susan and Julie that he's really sorry for all of the harm that he caused them, and he says that he won't bother them anymore. Susan then gives Mike his blessing to hang out with Zach. This is what I want to know. Why does Mike need Susan's blessing to hang out with Zach? They are broken up right now. Girl, who do, you, like, who do you think you are? She was friends with Mary Alice for a pretty long time before Mary Alice passed. So, I mean, she knows Zach well. This is like, this is her best friend's son. The whole Susan, Mike arguing about Zach thing for the whole first half of season two. Like three episodes in, it gets so old so fast. And that's pretty much um, what happens with most Susan storylines is they just go on for way too long. And finally, Mike, Susan, Julie, and Zach all go bowling together. And I don't know why they're together because they are broken up. But Julie and Zach are like friends. They know each other from school. And so they're all together. I guess it makes it a little less weird and less... Um, less possible to upset Paul if they're all together in a group and it's not like Mike talking shit about Paul with Zach or something, but that's where we are with them. Season two, episode 12. Betty starts trying to find an excuse to move because all eyes are on them now that there was a body outside their house. Bree asks the detective who worked on Rex's case to start looking into the Applewhites because she thinks there's something suspicious about them. And she says that she just has a sixth sense about these things. And the detective replies and says, you were engaged to the man who murdered your husband. <laughs> um, also, Brie has four glasses of wine with her lunch at a restaurant. She gets pulled over on her way home for drunk driving. She gets arrested and Brie begins to walk home. But Betty passes by and picks her up. Bria also warns Betty that people are suspicious of her. Betty then calls Edie and tells her she needs to put her house up for sale as soon as possible. And finally, Bree gets a call back from the detective and he tells her that the dead person who was found in the trunk was a private investigator from Chicago named Curtis Monroe. We get a little bit of the Scavos this episode. Basically, Tom is not happy with their current situation of him staying at home and Lynette working. It's just not working out the way he thought it would. Okay, over to the Youngs. At a blood drive, Zach discovers that he and Mike have the same rare blood type. Also, Noah is starting to get sicker. Um, you may recall, it was like last season, he told Mike he has cancer. Yeah, he's getting worse. He really wants to know what happened to Deirdre before he dies. And Mike lies to him to protect Zach. Also in this episode, Noah has a new nurse, Miss Felicia Tillman. That's right. She is Noah's new nurse. There is a little bit of a Susan moment in this episode that brings us into our next Susan arc of the season. So after a date gone horribly wrong with this silly little clumsy accident that she has, she goes to the ER and sees a hot doctor, Dr. Rod. I'm yawning. That's how Susan makes me feel. Susan really wants to go out with Dr. Ron, so she goes back to the hospital like the next day and starts making up all these symptoms so that she can spend time with Dr. Ron. He cannot figure out what is wrong with her, um, which is deeply upsetting to him. And like 
he's losing sleep over Susan's case and trying to figure out what's wrong. He goes over to her house to tell her how frustrated he is with the whole thing. So Susan confesses that she made up her symptoms. She is, however, diagnosed with a wandering spleen, which she will need surgery for. Okay, season two, episode 13. Caleb is moved to his own bedroom. Um, they've decided to let him out of the basement. Yay. The windows are, like, covered. It's, mm. Brie catches Danielle and Matthew making out, and Brie drags Matthew back to his home and tells Betty what happened between the two of them, and Betty slaps Matthew. And Betty is also upset because Caleb makes a comment about how pretty Danielle is. I'm going to hold my comments for a few more episodes on this because it's... Danielle is heartbroken over the way that Brie handled the situation with her and Matthew. She goes on yelling at Brie like, Daddy's dead and your boyfriend killed himself. So this persuades Brie to go over and talk to Betty and apologize for how escalated things got between the two of them earlier. Now when she goes over there, she sees Caleb peering out the window through some newspaper and she immediately recognizes him as the man who attacked Gabby in her home. Attacked and who escaped from the mental hospital. Danielle and Matthew tell each other secrets including the fact that the Vandicamps are covering up a hit and run. Betty then goes over to talk to Brie again and tells her that Matthew told her that Danielle told him all about the situation with Andrew and Mrs. Solis. So now they are in this kind of standoff where they both have damning information on each other, but Brie can't do anything about it because that would mean Andrew probably going to prison and also all of them being punished for covering up the crime so there's this really interesting dynamic introduced between the two of them in this episode that i kind of love kind of love that like two moms both having secrets to protect their kids now that their kids are dating they you know bring drama conflict sister mary bernard is back and she encourages carlos to get an annulment and then gabby tells the pastor that sister mary bernard is having an affair with carlos or at least having impure thoughts about carlos as a way to get rid of her sister mary bernard is transferred to another parish and then gabby goes over to that parish to brag about outsmarting her in the whole thing they have this like physical beat down and it's just like Gabby pulling a nun's hair and then this nun beating the crap out of her. Um, it's camp, I guess. Carlos tells Gabby he is desperate to have a baby and she tells him that she can't promise him that. So he is going to have to choose and he decides to choose Gabby. Um, he is okay with not having a child as long as he gets to stay with Gabby. Um, but this makes Gabby realize she does want to have a baby with him. So that's where they have settled on the baby decision for now. Continuing off of the plot line with the Scobos from last episode with Tom not being happy with their arrangement, Tom helps Lynette brainstorm ideas for a project at work. It goes really well. They're really collaborative together. They are just really on the same page and complement each other's work styles really well. So Tom has a job interview with Lynette and Lynette's boss, not Nina, but the other boss. Um, it goes really well. And Lynette agrees that she's okay with Tom taking a job and becoming her co-worker as long as he doesn't hold the situation where she got him fired last year over her head. And he agrees, so they start working together. And finally, Susan has to go through with her surgery. Um, Dr. Ron has never done a spleen removal before, though, so she doesn't want him on the case. Episode 14. So Brie is a very trustworthy neighbor, right? So everyone gives Brie their spare keys so that she can be the one to house sit for them when they go out of town. 
And this means she has a working key for the Apple White House. So one day when Betty and Matthew are gone, she goes into the Apple White House to talk to Caleb. Caleb shows Brie his old room in the basement and he tells her that he was locked down there for a while because he hurt a girl. Caleb ends up telling Betty about Brie's visit and so Betty goes to confront Brie about the whole thing. Brie tells Betty that Caleb told her about Melanie so Betty finally reveals some more information. And this is the first time that we as an audience get more information about what allegedly happened that night. Betty reveals that Melanie was a girl that Matthew dated. One night after they had a fight, Caleb convinced Melanie to meet him at the local lumber yard. Caleb told Melanie he was in love with her and that if he was her boyfriend, he would never break up with her. And then Melanie laughed in his face. He tried to kiss her. He got angry and hurt her. And there was an ax laying on the ground nearby. And Betty says, yes, my Caleb killed Melanie. The consistent use of a black man who is intellectually disabled as a sexual threat to women is upsetting. And this continues pretty much through the end of the season. It just gets worse. It's just all of these really harmful tropes piled onto each other. Like, this is some shit out of, like, the original 1930s Nancy Drew novels, which are just... <sighs> okay, let's move on. Um, Don't worry, you guys. There is not just one spoonful of racism this episode, but we begin to get the second big dosage of it for the season. Jane Lynch is hosting a dinner party and the FBI break in and she's arrested for involuntary servitude because it turns out she was holding this young Chinese woman named Xiao Mein um, captive and making her work for her. Xiao Mein is then introduced to the Solis family by the pastor who Carlos has been working with. Um, and Carlos has offered their guest room to her so she can stay while the church arranges for her to go back to China. Um, while Gabby is out for the day, Xiao Mei mends and cooks and, you know, takes care of the house, which really impresses Gabby. And she decides she would like to hire Xiao Mei to be their maid. Okay, so we do have a few fun things this episode. Thank the good Lord. Um, Tom is getting along really great with the boss of the uh, marketing firm but it's like giving frat boy behavior they're making all these bets at one point like tom is drinking toilet water because the guys dared him to it's a mess so lynette wants to put a stop to it their boss and tom agree that they will knock off all their bets and their shenanigans if lynette will eat a pound of raw bacon um, which they have on hand because they are working on a campaign for a bacon company. So Lynette eats a pound of raw bacon. All right, we have more going on. Felicia gives Noah a note in his mailbox telling him that he has a grandchild. Um, so Noah makes a call and he thinks Mike might be holding out on him. So then a man shows up and tells Mike that Noah wants to talk to him about Zach. And Mike tells Noah about Zach finally, and he says that Deirdre gave him up voluntarily. Okay, and one last plot this episode, Susan. Um, I remember how I said we were entering her second arc? Well, here it is. Susan finds out she no longer has health insurance because of an issue with her agent that happened earlier in the season. So she goes to Carl to talk about who she can sue for the money <laughs> uh, very american is like you don't have health insurance you have no money but maybe i can sue someone edie suggests that she gets married to someone with really good health insurance so she finds a guy for susan to marry and it's this gay man whose mother really wants to see him be married before she dies so he is planning to go through with it and marry susan the next day um, so she can have her health insurance and he can make his mom happy but then his partner shows up and he thought that when this man said Susan was sick, that she like had cancer and therefore needed the health insurance, not she had a wandering spleen. So this just isn't really enough to make the guy happy. So he decides to call it quits on the wedding. And Susan um, is 
out of luck. And then Carl volunteers to marry her instead. All right, season two, episode 15. Brie passes out drunk on the lawn. Her drinking situation is getting worse and worse. She tells Andrew and Danielle that the reason she got so drunk was because she took antihistamines for her allergies and it just didn't interact well, but usually she would never get that drunk. And so she's like, I'll stop taking the antihistamines. And Andrew has this line, it's like, wait, so you're gonna give up your antihistamines because you can't give up alcohol? This goes hand in hand with Lynette's plot for the episode. So basically, Tom asks Mrs. McCluskey, we haven't talked about her in a while, but she's still here, my darling girl. Um, Tom asks Mrs. McCluskey if she will watch the kids, and Lynette thinks she is too old to be responsible enough to watch the kids, so she leaves them with Brie instead. Now, Brie is hungover, and also she decides to have a little glass of wine while she is babysitting the boys and Penny. She falls asleep. Um, presumably passed out drunk and the boys and Penny walk out of the house and a salon ends up calling Lynette and Tom and saying that their kids are there so they go and rescue them and go home and Bree tells her that she doesn't know what happened the kids just were gone and you know two seconds she turned around and they were just gone and then Mrs. McCluskey tells Lynette that when Bree came over to McCluskey's looking for the kids she smelled wine on her breath, and she tells her that she found her passed out on the lawn. So Lynette goes to talk to Brie to ask if she has some kind of drinking problem. Brie insists that she does not, but then Lynette finds just how many empty bottles are in Brie's recycling that week. So she takes them and lines them all up on her porch with a note that says, still think you don't have a problem. And the voiceover of Mary Alice's that plays over this moment is, a loving friend has just done us an enormous favor. So Brie comes to terms with the fact that she does have a drinking problem. All right, so we have a interesting Gabby Carlos plot this episode. Gabby's mom comes into town. Um, Gabby learns that because of the miscarriage, she cannot carry a baby and Carlos doesn't want to adopt. So Gabby brings up maybe surrogacy. Um, her mom offers to carry the child for them, but Gabby kicks her out. She does not want anything to do with her mother. Gabby then tells Carlos that her mother only wanted to carry the baby because she wanted a place to stay and she wanted some money from them. Um, we also learn here that there is something about Gabby's stepfather that Gabby has not told her mother. And Carlos asks why she hasn't told her about it. There is a beautiful scene from Eva Longoria here, like one of her best scenes in the series. She is really killing it this season. She is crying about her stepfather and how her mother wouldn't have believed her if she knew. So we learn here that when Gabby was a teenager, she was sexually assaulted by her stepfather. Carlos goes to Gabby's mom and tells her that in order for the two of them to start getting along again, she and Gabby needs to patch things up. He also tells her about what happened with Gabby and her stepfather, and Gabby's mom says that she is well aware of what happened, and um, she tells Carlos that Gabby, quote, seduced him. Carlos immediately goes home, and he basically tells Gabby that she's right, her mother is not an option for surrogacy, and they decide they should look into adoption. I'm glad that Carlos did the right thing and decided not to try and fix the relationship up anymore because obviously they are not in a place to repair what they have. Okay, Zach is interested in learning more about his biological parents, and Paul says that he only met his biological mother once, so he really doesn't have any more information for him. And then another PI tells Noah about Deirdre and the trunk and how Deirdre dies, including the fact that the young killed her. Noah now knows that Zach is his grandson and he implies very strongly that he wants Paul to be murdered. And Felicia Tillman looks very pleased about this when she overhears. All right, almost to the end of this one, Edie finds a ring and a prenup in Carl's briefcase, and she assumes that he is going to propose to her. But after a disastrous Valentine's Day dinner where she was waiting for him to pop the question the whole time, 
Um, Susan finally tells her that Carl is going to marry her in order for her to get the health insurance. Susan also tells Carl that Edie thought he was going to propose to her, so Carl begins to wonder if maybe he should. Susan and Carl sign the prenup, and they go ahead and get married again. Pretty crazy. Pretty crazy stuff. Season 2, episode 16. Bree and Andrew are... Button heads again. So Andrew tells Bree that he decided he really wants a car. Remember, he used to have a car and then he hit Juanita Solis, but now he no longer has a car. Um, she tells him that she can't trust him with his trust fund until he is 21. Um, he will not see any of that money until he is 21. He calls her a mean old drunk and she slaps him. Now, that slap, unfortunately, is the slip up that Andrew has been waiting several episodes. For. Andrew tells Justin, his boyfriend, to punch him so that it leaves a dark bruise and he has more evidence of Bree's physical abuse against him. And then Andrew hires a lawyer because he wants to be emancipated. Now, when he is emancipated, this means that he will have control over his trust fund. Bree decides that in order to maintain custody of her son Andrew, she will quit drinking. It's also important to note, Andrew will be 18 in just a few months. Even though he can't get his trust fund until he's 21, unless he gets emancipated, there's like only a few months left with him really living with her. Like things are just getting bad. Bree tells Andrew that it's her job to teach him and her job is not done yet. He is not the man that she knows he can be. She also says that the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. So as long as he hates her, at least he still cares. Yabby and Carlos begin the adoption process and they go to a local adoption agency, but unfortunately, Helen Rowland, John's mom, works there. This is probably absolute worst case scenario for them. So she brings up the fact that Gabby statutorily raped her son and also that Carlos went to prison for international slave labor. Helen also tells Carlos and Gabby that she has already called every adoption agency anywhere nearby, so their chances are pretty much screwed. And this means that Carlos and Gabby's last option is to go through a pretty sketchy process with this man. They're paying a lot of money to help them find a child. Tom and Lynette have a fight about how she is the boss everywhere. She is higher up than him at work and at home, and she's a control freak, and she never lets him breathe. And she basically tells him, like, I'm sorry you feel that way, but you cannot put that on me. That's on you. So Tom says he will step up, and then the next day, they fuck in the elevator at work. That is television. Paul is taken to the police department for some questioning and he gets beat up in a van. It's pretty clear to the viewer that this is something that Noah somehow set up through all of his connections. Mike tells Noah that he will tell Zach about him harming Paul and then Paul gets home. He is alive after all. He survived this brutal fucking attack in the van. Zach tells Mike that he is willing to meet Noah if it means that he will leave them alone. And Zach also tells Noah if anything happens to Paul, he will never speak to him again. And Noah says, wow, we've only met five minutes ago and you're already blackmailing me. I couldn't be prouder. Noah then reveals to Zach that Mike is his biological father. Finally, Susan gets her surgery. She is about to be wheeled into surgery and she makes a confession um, that she loves Mike. Dr. Ron is like, who the fuck is Mike? Episode 17. Matthew tells Betty that he feels it's time to put Caleb into a permanent home for his care because taking care of him and also trying to hide all this evidence has just become too much. Danielle gets home and she finds Caleb in her bedroom waiting to wish her a happy birthday. Bree begins going to AA meetings and she meets a man named Peter. Andrew's emancipation case is continuing to build and he tells Bree he is starting to remember some sexual abuse as well, which is very clearly indicated by the way it's presented in the show. 
that that is a lie Andrew is making up. Brie falls asleep in a department store. She gets locked inside and she can't find a way out. So she ends up calling Peter to ask for his help at like two in the morning. He's a sweet, charming guy. We love Peter in this household. Um, but yeah, Peter and Brie have sort of formed a friendship now. Gabby and Carlos meet a potential birth mom. She works at a strip club and she says she doesn't know who the father is. This woman, Libby, heavily implies to Gabby and Carlos and the man who is coordinating the adoption that she does not want Gabby and Carlos to have their baby because they're Latino and that means they won't have as much money as other couples. So Gabby and Carlos give her a few expensive presents. She is like smirking and she's very proud of herself when Gabby comes to hand off this like expensive diamond necklace. Gabby realizes that was her plan all along and Libby says, yeah, um, I'm a lot smarter than everybody thinks. At the end of the episode, we see Libby has a long-term boyfriend and he does no idea who the Solises are. So she has clearly not told him about this adoption plan and perhaps is not actually planning on going through with it, just wants some money out of the Solises. Susan promises Dr. Ron that she is not in love with, nor does she know anyone named Mike, and also that she will be divorcing Carl ASAP, and then she invites Ron over for dinner. At dinner, Dr. Ron accidentally meets Mike, and he hears his first name and realizes this is indeed the Mike. Uh, he is not happy, and Susan is left a pathetic bumbling mess in the street. Sucks to suck. Episode 18. Bree and Peter are really hitting it off. She kisses him and it almost goes further, but then Peter stops it and he tells Bree that he is a member of SA as well as AA, which is Sex Addicts Anonymous. Bree kisses him again. He almost fucks her, but he leaves. Mary Alice's voice line at this moment says the easiest way to overcome an addiction is to replace it with a new one. Peter then introduces Bree to a new sponsor because he doesn't want to risk his sobriety or his celibacy for her. Bree learns that Lynette will be called to give a deposition in the emancipation case. She goes over and tells her that she has joined AA and asks if she can rely on her support. Lynette indicates that she will not be lying under any circumstances and that if she's asked about the situation that happened that week, she will have to be honest about it. Andrew's lawyer then pays Lynette a visit and shows her a picture of Andrew's bruise, um, which was given to him by Justin, but who the lawyer and who Lynette now thinks is from Brie. Lynette is very surprised to see it, but, you know, there's a picture, so there's some evidence of it. Lynette then talks to Andrew a little bit before the deposition because she has begun to suspect that he may be in it for the money, like Bree suggested, after all. She is working on a campaign for a car company, so she has this really fancy car in her driveway, and Andrew is walking by and checks it out. They talk a little bit about the deposition and also the car, and Andrew asks if he can get a discount on one of these from her. So this interaction is all Lynette needs to know that Andrew really does have ulterior motives. During the deposition, she lies a little bit to protect Brie. Andrew says that Lynette is lying during the deposition, and Lynette says um, she would never lie, and in fact, she hates liars, which makes Andrew shot right up because he, of course, is lying just as much, if not more, during his own deposition. All of the stress of this also makes Bree decide to have another drink. Gabby and Carlos learn that Libby has a boyfriend, and he refers to the baby as, quote, our baby. Um, Libby's boyfriend wants to and plans to keep the baby, and then Libby tells him that she doesn't know who the father is, so he kind of changes his mind. And then Libby goes into labor. Libby tells her boyfriend who the father is. It turns out to be his brother. So Gabby and Carlos, while well, they are bickering, take the opportunity to leave the hospital with the baby. They just take the fucking baby. It is kind of cute, though. They, like, run out with the baby, and Carlos and Gabby are trying to figure out how to put the baby seat into the car so they can drive the baby home safe. Like, that's cute, I guess. Um, we just have to not think about the other stuff too much, you know? Just, like, don't let it... Don't let it ruin the fun. <laughs> Edie plans to throw a surprise wedding for her and Carl. 
Um, but then Susan and Carl ruin the surprise and tell Edie about their marriage. So to make things up to her, Edie tells Carl to pay for their full wedding when they have one and also says that Susan will have to help with the planning and the execution of all of it, including being a bartender during her engagement party, which we see in the same episode. During the engagement party, Julie and Susan find an old photo of Carl and Susan stuck into one of Carl's books that he has held on to for all this time, and Susan confronts him about it, and then Carl kisses her. I also believe it's in this episode where Felicia Tillman gives Edie a gift at her party, and it is Martha Huber's dentures, and she explains that she knows Edie was such a good friend of her, so she wanted something special to give her. Felicia Tillman is just like one of the fucking weirdest ass people. I love her. She's so crazy. I love her. Episode 19. Bree's stepmother shows up to the court hearing. She is played by none other than Carol Burnett. I always gasp every time she comes on screen because like I forget that she's in this episode. It's very exciting. Brie and Andrew end up like bickering to expose each other to Brie's parents and she reveals Brie that um, Andrew hit a woman with a car. <laughs> Her mom asks, is she okay? And Brie replies, she's dead. Comedy heaven. It's so good. Their banter in the scene, phenomenal. I love the way that Marsha Cross and Carol Burnett play off each other. It's just, it's beautiful stuff. Bree's parents tell Bree that they are going to have Andrew come and live with him. Justin is pissed about this because it means that Andrew would be moving away, so Bree suggests that maybe the two of them work together to find a way to get him to stay. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge and appreciate the fact that Bree is being so friendly with Justin, who is Andrew's boyfriend. Like, there was a moment there where we were kind of scared that Bree was not accepting and, you know homophobic but she's kind of beating those allegations right now i will say i'm gonna give her some kudos for it unfortunately this is kind of short-lived because while andrew and the parents are helping pack his things she brings down a box of magazines they are adult magazines and she's like oh don't forget these and the grandparents are like oh what are these and Bree's like oh you know just some of his porn magazines you know boys the grandparents just kind of laugh like they're they're not thrilled about this but then they look at them and they are gay adult magazines so brie essentially outed andrew to the grandparents they decide they are not okay with this and they take away his trust fund and do not take andrew to come live with them brie also invites justin over for dinner that night so that the three of them can have dinner together and you know brie wants to be supportive as possible um because she doesn't want to lose Andrew. And there's also this voiceover line, if we try and learn from our mistakes and grow, it's like, Brie loves the gays now, okay? Like, yeah, yeah, she kind of added Andrew, but she loves the gays. She loves them. Gabby and Carlos are granted temporary custody of Lily until they can get an answer from whether or not the birth father wants to give up custody or not. Um, but Gabby keeps giving the parenting duties off to Xiao Mei instead of actually taking care of Lily herself. We also get more Felicia in this episode in one of my favorite series of weird bitch behavior ever. Felicia starts trying to do something bad to Paul. That's how I'll phrase it. So first, Felicia puts shortening on Paul's doorstep. So he walks outside his front door and just like slips and falls on his ass. And then she replaces the lighter fluid by his grill outside with gasoline. So this fire like blows up in his face. And then she gets Paul's house tented for termites while he is still inside. Oops, and she's like, oh my bad, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that, what? And she's like present and watching him. Like, after the, the grill thing happened, she's like, oh, it smells good over there. Okay, few Susan things this episode. Susan sees Mike at the movie theater, and she doesn't want him to know that she's single, so she goes and sits next to this man named Orson. This is the first time we are introduced to Orson. Here he is, Orson Hodge. Um, he is a dentist, 
and he is nice enough to pretend that he is on a date with Susan when Mike says hello to her. Anyway, Orson stops by Susan's and she left her wallet at the theater, so he's just come to bring that home. Um, they have a chat over coffee. There's this great cut between uh, two parts of the scene. So first, Susan is like, I don't want to bore you with the details. And then it cuts and Orson is like, so you're in love with your ex. So clearly she has told this man every personal detail about her life. Um, but Orson, it's like he's introduced as this like fun, um, kind, thoughtful uh, man who is willing to kind of jump on board with whatever's happening with the people he's around and that's kind of fun. I like it. I like who Orson is in this episode. It's a pretty good introduction to the character, I think. At this point, Carl tells Susan that he ended things. Carl and Susan hook up and then in the morning, Carl reveals that he didn't actually break up with Edie yet. He wanted an answer from Susan first and to see how things went. So Susan is now the other woman and she like chases him out of the house and Julia is just standing there eating her cereal. This poor girl, someone free her, please. <laughs> All right, we are now truly in the home stretch. I took a little break. I laid down, the sun has set. I'm ready to bring it home with season two. Okay, let's jump right into the Apple Whites. Season two, episode 20. So the Applewhite's house sells, Danielle is devastated, and she tells Matthew that they just need to find a way to get Caleb in a home so that they don't have to move after all. Matthew comes up with a plan. He tells Caleb that Danielle wants a kiss goodbye and that he should kiss her even if she says she doesn't want one. So Caleb goes to Danielle and he, quote, attacks her. I say, quote, because it was planned he didn't have the intent of attacking her. Matthew literally told him, no matter what you do, make sure you kiss Danielle. Matthew then goes on to check on Danielle and they're all like giggly about it and proud of themselves for this plan working. After this incident, Betty tells Matthew that she's going to give Caleb medicine that will kill him so he can go in peace and not have to live out his life in a home where he will be permanently cared for. In this episode, Bree and Peter continue their friendship. Um, he calls her when he gets into some trouble. He is at a sex party and calls Bree and asks her to come pick him up. He explains that he was not there because he was going to participate in it, but he just wanted Bree to come see the lifestyle that he could get himself back into if she pushes him too far. For Gabby and Carlos, Lily's father decides that he does want the baby. Gabby shows up at the kid's high school and she convinces him to sign the adoption papers. The way she convinces him basically is saying that he won't go to college with a football or basketball scholarship if he is also a single father. Like the whole thing is just a mess. And so for the good of his own future, this is the right thing to do. He signs the papers and then social workers and Libby show up at the Solis house because Libby has changed her mind and decides that she wants to keep the baby. She and her boyfriend have agreed that they will raise the baby together and they think they want to give a family a shot. This scene from Eva Longoria is gorgeous. Every woman in this season gets one really big scene like this that is just everything. So this is Gabby's scene. Um, Lynette's would be that scene where she's crying in bed with Tom. Bree's, I would say, is when she is yelling at Rex that she has nothing to be forgiven for. And even Susan has a moment. I'll give her that. I would say it's when Paul tells Mike that Susan knows where Zach is and she's begging for Mike's forgiveness. So they all have a beautiful scene like that in the season. Speaking of Lynette and Tom, Lynette accidentally sends a sexy instant message to her boss instead of Tom. She quickly goes into his office and apologizes and says, obviously that was meant for Tom, I'm so sorry. And then the boss starts explaining that he wishes that he and his wife talked like that. He just doesn't really know how to do it and like he feels weird about it. And so Lynette helps him. And then his wife finds out that it was not him sending those messages. Now, Ed told his wife it was Tom who sent those messages. He tells Lynette that his wife has ordered him to fire whoever it was who sent her those messages. 
which means Tom is completely fucked. Lynette points out that they have contracts and that he can't fire Tom without good reason or she will sue. It's this whole thing. So that's where we're left for now. We'll come back. We get one of my favorite cold openings this episode. Basically, Carl breaks up with Edie for good and he is leaving early in the morning, but she catches him before he's out the door and there's already like a goodbye note on the pillow. Carl is trying to pull away. Edie like picks up a rake. She's gonna, you know, beat his car in and his car won't start. And then he finally gets his car to start. He's like zooming out just in time and then he pulls out and a big garbage truck hits his car and the voiceover line from Mary Alice is about how Carl couldn't believe why God had forsaken him. It never occurred to Carl that God might be a woman. Edie has no idea that the woman Carl is leaving her for is Susan. So she hires a PI to try and sort out who Carl cheated on her with. Episode 21. We are really in it now, folks. On her picnic with Caleb, Betty and Caleb talk about the situation where he kissed Danielle, since that is the incident that has pushed her to give him ice cream filled with a drug that will kill him. Caleb tells Betty that Danielle wanted a really big kiss, and that is what Matthew told him. This sudden discovery that Caleb did not act this way on his own, Matthew influenced him, is a huge revelation to poor Betty. She asks, what else did your brother tell you? From there, he is, Matthew is fucked. Betty goes home, and she locks Matthew in the basement. Bree invites Justin and Peter over for dinner. Bree talks to Peter on the phone, and... Tells him she doesn't want everyone to know he's a sex addict, but they can talk about the AA stuff at the dinner. That's okay. Andrew listens in, and he thinks that this news is hilarious. So he tells Danielle that the two of them can figure something out to get back at Brie for everything she has done to Andrew. Peter stops by after the dinner to give Andrew a college catalog, and he accidentally lets it slip that he is bisexual. So Andrew fucks Peter. Bree walks into the bedroom after they are finished, and Andrew is smirking, and he says, now we're even. They are planning to go look at this college that Andrew got the catalog for. They're still going. Bree stops at a gas station. She gets out of the car and hands Andrew a bag and apologizes to him and basically says that she will be leaving him there. There's money in the bag. He can walk back to the bus station they passed about a mile ago. He can go anywhere he wants. There's a lot of things I want to comment on here. This final scene between the two of them is so heartbreaking. It's widely stated that Brie abandoned her son on the side of the road because he is gay. But that is not what happened. He fucked her boyfriend, who she was trying very hard to protect. Andrews also hit her and spit on her and blamed her for everything. I'm not saying Brie did nothing wrong either, okay? I'm just saying there's a lot more than Andrew being gay that is at play here. Andrew and Brie are a shit show, and so she leaves Andrew on the side of the road. All right, let's talk about the Solises. Xiao Mei has a handful of papers stating that she will be deported back to China soon, which she does not want because, quote, my uncle will sell me again. God. The Solises have a realization that Xiao Mei can stay in America if she has an American baby. So they suggest that she become their surrogate. I don't have to tell you how f fucked up this whole plot is, right? It's not just me, like, we all are kind of nodding and like, oh, right? Just checking. Okay, update on Lynette and the Tom being fired situation. So they're really struggling at work because Ed is being a complete asshole to them. Ed has hired a forensic accountant to go through all of Tom's shit. And if he finds a single receipt out of line, Tom has a credible reason to lose his job. Lynette once again goes to Ed and insists that this is an overreaction to what happened and it's not fair to take out what happened in his marriage out on her and Tom. Ed shows Lynette some receipts that indicate Tom has been taking detours on all of his business trips to Atlantic City, including tickets to a show and flowers. And he says to Lynette, before you go poking your head in my marriage, fix your own. Tom? 
Tom, what the hell is going on? This isn't like you, Tom. Tom, what's going on? What the fuck? Tom, what is happening? The PI is spying on Susan and Carl. Mike discovers him. He punches him because he is still in love with Susan and wants to protect her. Susan, once hearing this PI was discovered by Mike, decides that she is going to come clean to Edie and tell her the full truth. So she writes a letter explaining everything. Now Mike pays the PI off. And this is a lot of fucking money. It's like 12 grand or something absolutely ridiculous. But Susan has already sent the letter. Edie is not all that pleased. She burns Susan's house down. Okay, episode 22. Bree forgot Danielle's birthday, so she throws her a late birthday party. Now that Andrew is gone and Danielle thinks that Andrew ran away, Bree is truly just at her breaking point. Things are not great for her. One of the girls accidentally knocks the birthday cake onto the floor at the party, and that sends Bree into a nervous breakdown. Susan is staying with Bree temporarily since her house burned down, and so she helps her clean up. And Bree explains that she was fine, and then suddenly she was just outside of her body. She can't sleep because every time she closes her eyes, she sees Andrew's face in the rearview mirror. And she tells Susan the truth about what happened, that she left Andrew on the side of the road and now has no idea where he is. Danielle leaves Brie a note saying that her and Matthew are going to be running away together. This is the last fucking straw for Brie because now she has lost both of her children. So she drives to to the mental hospital and admits herself, saying that she thinks she is about to have a nervous breakdown. Meanwhile, for the Applewhites, Matthew admits to setting Caleb up with that whole situation. And when Betty comes downstairs, he, remember Matthew is locked up now in the basement. Danielle is there waiting. She whacks Betty over the head to knock her out. Um, and then she takes the keys from her and she and Matthew escape together. And that's when they run away. For Gabby, she begins to become upset that Carlos is putting Xiao Mei and the baby's needs in front of her own. I also want to talk a little bit about how when Xiao Mei agrees to carry their child, um, she doesn't understand how the process will work. And so she goes and lays naked in Carlos's bed, expecting that he will be having sex with her. This poor girl, I don't know, man. I hate this whole plot line. I hate it so much. What's all upsetting about it is that this plot line ultimately is meant to be the final straw in Gabby and Carlos's marriage. So all the stuff with Xiao Mei is just finding a way to break Gabby and Carlos up, which I'll talk about in the season finale, I think. Tom tells Lynette that he is going to Atlantic City. And Lynette tells him that she is well aware that he's been there. He says he's been going strictly for business and he has a whole explanation for the thing. Like the flowers were for this guy's wife because he wanted to impress her. And then the tickets for the show were because he went with the guy um, so they could talk business after. It was just like a social thing essential to business. Um, he also like has a card for the guy in Atlantic City and says that Lynette is welcome to call the number if she doesn't believe him. She then like goes into the bathroom to cry and when she comes out, she sees him slip the card back into his pocket so that Lynette won't actually end up calling the number. Lynette decides to talk to Mrs. McCluskey about the whole situation and Mrs. McCluskey happily helps her set up to go to Atlantic City to kind of follow Tom and see what's up. At the airport, she asks, what if I see him with another woman? What do I do then? And Mrs. McCluskey says, I have a gun. And I also would like to remind you that in season one, we had that scene where Lynette told Tom that if he ever cheated on her, she would take the kids and leave him. So stakes are high. And also they have been through so much between the struggles with Lynette being a stay-at-home mom and then starting work again. And then Tom struggling at home and now both of them working together. Like they've just in the last, eight months have been through so much stuff and made it through as a couple. So now to find out that he is potentially being unfaithful, get that gun, girl. She goes to Atlantic City. She follows him to this house and she hides in the bushes to see who is there with Tom. And it is a woman and they both have a glass of wine and then they walk up these stairs together. I can just imagine 
the way that collectively across the United States of America, everyone's heart sank on this day when they saw this scene. When Tom gets home, Lynette is gone, the kids are gone. He goes over to Mrs. McCluskey and asks where Lynette and the kids are. She goes, she packed up the kids and the puppy and left. All right, on to the Paul Felicia storyline. Felicia calls 911 to say Paul has been threatening her. They aren't really being much of a help, so she says that she will just have to go confront him herself. Meanwhile, we see her while on the phone with the cops taking her own blood. And she takes a bag of her blood aside and she's been like collecting her blood over time for presumably a few weeks or months. I don't know. She has a lot of blood. When Paul gets to his home, there is blood everywhere. That's when the police show up at his home. And they find in his trunk the tips of two of Felicia's fingers. And then we see Felicia arriving at a cabin up in the mountains. She has successfully framed Paul for her murder. I just gotta say, like, Felicia Tillman commits to the bit. There is no one on Wisteria Lane who commits to the bit more than Felicia Tillman. And for that, we owe her a moment of appreciation. Thank you, Felicia. Orson is kind enough to stop by Susan's to help her clean up after the fire. Edie admits to cleaning up Susan's house. She says, yes, I burned down your house, you sleazy little whore. Um, Susan is then wired so that she can try and get Edie to confess again so she can press charges. <laughs> Susan says, you can't just go around burning down people's homes. And Edie replies, you burned down mine. This is just Camp Central and Felicia's funny as hell too. So at least there's kind of a nice balance between things that are just fucking upsetting and like, Girlie's having fun. I took a crucial note here, which is um, when Mike is helping Susan mic herself up, which is that Susan has a navel piercing. Susan tries to run away from Edie after she discovers that she is wearing a wire, and Edie has another phenomenal line. You cannot run me, my arm in the best shape of my life. Edie is then attacked by a bunch of bees. While in the hospital, Edie tells Susan that every time something bad happens to her, Susan is standing nearby. She is sick of it, and she is going to destroy Susan. She tells Susan that she never misses an opportunity to play the victim. She knows that Susan thinks that all of the sympathy she always gets is because she's loved, but it doesn't mean she's loved. It means she's helpless. She kind of gagged me there. <laughs> I forgot about that specific scene, and when I was doing my rewatch and I got to it, I... I gasped, I moved, I was like, wow, I fucking love Edie. Season one and two, Edie is peak Edie. Season three, she does some things that I just do not agree with ethically, which like, this is Desperate Housewives, so. But you know what I mean. There's a few things that just go a little too far that I don't like, but. Season one and two, Edie, my girl, my fucking girl. Susan ends up staying with Brie, as I mentioned before. Mike does offer to let Susan and Julie stay with him, but Susan declines the offer after Edie tells her she's helpless. All right, my dudes, season two, episode 23. We have two episodes to go. We start with a flashback. Um, it starts with Caleb and Melanie. He asks her to be his girlfriend. She laughs at him. He tries to kiss her. She fights back. She whacks him with a stick. He grabs the stick and hits her, knocking her out. So this is just a retelling of the story that we got earlier um, when Betty told Bree everything that happened. So the Applewhites are about to leave town, meaning Betty and Caleb. As the Applewhites are like ready to go out the door, the police arrive and they have photos of the Melanie Foster crime scene. Her body was covered in a jacket. Betty tells them it's not Caleb's jacket, it's her other son, Matthews. We go back to the flashbacks and see that Melanie was actually alive after Caleb left the scene. Yes, he did hit her and knock her out, but she was alive. She then tells Matthew that if he doesn't go home with her that night, then she will tell the police what Caleb did to her. 
So Matthew starts beating her with the stick. It's hard. It's really hard to watch this scene. Betty then calls Brie and leaves her message. Remember that Danielle and Matthew have just run away together. And she gives Brie the message that it was Matthew, not Caleb, who murdered Melanie. Brie attempts to leave the mental hospital, but the doctors will not let her leave. Um, they just think that she is crazy for saying that her daughter is with a murderer and all right let's hop over to the solis situation gabby wants to go golfing with carlos but he says no uh he's busy he has to go do his community service at the country club gabby sees on the news that a latino man has been killed um, by a car while he was doing community service cleaning up a roadside. There is a sketch and it looks just like Carlos, like that Carlos is fucking dead. And they say on the news that they will not release the name until the family has been notified. And like right at that second, Gabby's cell phone rings. She goes home and she sits outside the house just staring. Carlos is fucking dead. Xiao Mei comes out to ask why she's home so early. Gabby says, Carlos is dead. Xiao Mei says, no, please don't kill him. She says, no, he's already dead. And Xiao Mei says, no, he's in the kitchen. Carlos is indeed alive and well. However, he paid someone else to go in his place to this community service. And also, he's all sweaty. And also, Xiao Mei suggested that Gabby had a reason to kill him. So Gabby starts to be a, a little bit suspicious. Where What has Carlos been doing this afternoon? And why would she want to kill him? At a hotel, Lynette has the kids and she explains that they are going to go stay with grandma once they leave the hotel. Porter falls off the railing, um, <laughs> off like the balcony. It's like one story down. And so of course they all rush to the hospital. She calls Tom because their kid just fell in. Luckily, all he has is a broken arm. This is when Lynette tells him what she saw. So Tom reveals that the woman that Lynette saw him with is named Nora. They had a one night stand 12 years ago, which is before him and Lynette were together. And they have a child together. He just very recently found out about the child when the mother, Nora, contacted him. And he wanted to take a paternity test um, you know, meet with Nora a few times to figure out the situation and ensure that he is the father. And now he has confirmed he is indeed the father of this 11-year-old girl named Kayla. He also says that he absolutely planned to tell Lynette, but he felt no need to concern her in the whole thing before he got the results from the paternity test, so that's why it had been kept a secret. I also want to note that in season one, you may recall Tom had some sort of secret that Lynette didn't know about. Now, because Tom says he just found out about Kayla, this is not the secret he had as of that episode, which was like early mid season one. The only thing I could think of, this like kept me up last night. I do wonder if that season one secret might be that his ex-girlfriend was working with him. Remember how he gave his ex-girlfriend a job? I wonder if maybe... That's it, but I don't know for sure. Anyway, Tom is a kid. Her name is Kayla, and this is Nora. We don't meet her till next episode, but I love this bitch, okay? We'll get to her when we get to her. On to the youngs. Paul asks Zach for some money um, so he can help him get a lawyer because he has been arrested for the murder of Felicia Tillman. Noah refuses to give Zach the money, and he also tells him that he will not get a cent from him until he is dead. Noah tells Zach that Zach is just not strong enough to handle all that responsibility and money yet. He doesn't deserve to be rewarded because he doesn't, he hasn't shown what a, a powerful man he is. So Zach gets up and he closes the bedroom doors. Zach then walks over to the ventilator and looks at the machine for a moment. And he, you know, he's considering just pulling the plug on the whole thing. And then he takes a step away and then... Noah says, see, that's why I can't give you the keys to the kingdom, kid. You have no balls. And then Zach shuts off the ventilator and Noah dies. You guys know what time it is. You know. And just like that, Susan buys an RV for her and Julie to live in so that they don't have to stay with Bree. Mike kisses Susan when they have coffee together. 
and then Carl sees Mike at a jewelry shop. He is planning to propose to Susan. So Carl buys a house for Susan and Julie. It's a love triangle. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Like, wh why? Susan, why? We have now made it to the season two finale. I truly cannot believe I am filming the season two finale right now. This video has been so much work and something I've been so nervous for. So I just thought I would take this opportunity to say thank you so much for watching. Um, if you've watched this far, you are a fucking trooper. And I'm really glad that we can be hanging out like this. Season two, episode 24, the season two finale. Let's start off with Gabby. Thanks to a little help from Lynette's baby monitors, Gabby is able to set them up and catch Carlos in the act with Xiaomei, therefore confirming that they are having an affair. I feel weird even calling it an affair, like the power issues and like the surrogacy and there's a lot to unpack there. We will get to unpack it more in the beginning of season three. So I will leave it here for now. And yeah, that is that is Gabby's season two. Now on to Lynette. Nora shows up to meet Lynette. Um, she didn't bring Kayla. The three of them, Nora, Lynette, and Tom meet at a diner. Nora asks Tom for 11 years of back pay on child support. They simply do not have um, the money for. Nora decides that she will stop asking for back pay. Um, and instead, she puts the money down on a house near the family. Lynette and Nora are not getting along very well. Nora, for lack of a better phrase, is annoying as fuck. She is pushy and abrasive and whiny, and I love her. I just think, I truly, like, I don't even mean that sarcastically. I am so entertained by Nora. I love an annoying brunette bitch. That's my toxic trait as a viewer of television, sue me. Um, I think Nora is fun. She provides an interesting conflict without being too convoluted. That's where we leave Tom and Lynette for season two. On to the youngs. Zach is told that he gets everything of Noah's, but he tells Paul that Noah did not leave him any money at all. That's it for them for season two. All right, now let's talk about the conclusion of the Applewhite storyline. Bree manages to escape the mental hospital. Danielle and Matthew go to the Vandekamp home to take some money out of the safe. They also go to the Applewhite home to gather some food. Betty confronts Matthew. Now that she knows that Matthew was okay with Caleb taking the blame for the murder of Melanie Foster, and I mean everything that they have put Caleb through in the past year or however long it's been um with him being literally held prisoner in his own home by his own mother because of this lie that he told and like betty still chose to do that though so she's not completely off the hook but like you know what i'm saying right she is mad at matthew so she calls the police and reports his location and reports that he is the one who killed melanie foster Matthew returns to Danielle in the Vandekamp home. They are gathering their things. They are ready to run out the door and leave. Bree gets home right in time, and she tells Danielle that Matthew is a killer. Danielle insists that she's wrong, and they fight for a moment, and Bree says, um, no, I gave up on your brother, and I'm not going to make that mistake again. At this point, Matthew pulls a gun on Bree. Um, he threatens to shoot her. Bree steps forward, she's so fucking badass in this moment, and says, if that's what it takes to get my daughter to see that you're a killer, do it. Police then arrive, and Matthew is sniped through the window. Um, he dies immediately, and Bree holds Danielle in her arms while she screams and wails for the loss of her boyfriend. <sighs> Caleb and Betty leave town. That's that. They are they are free from this and i fucking hope that caleb gets some justice and is treated better but yeah that's the end of the apple white plot line i better do the final honors of the season hang on much of the apple white story uses incredibly harmful tropes that have been used for centuries in fiction um it does not challenge them in any way that is not the way that this is framed for us, okay? It is just framed as a domestic drama, which 
that's fine but it's incredibly irresponsible the way that so many tropes are piled onto one another i mean as if seeing this man in shackles at the end of episode one isn't bad enough is it an effective mystery does it mechanically work in a show like desperate housewives when compared to season one the Applewhite mystery is incredibly weak, mostly because it is so isolated. We get that interaction at the end, uh, and it ramps up between Danielle and Matthew, but if it weren't for that one connection, that's, that's pretty much all that this has. Oh, and Betty taught Susan some piano in one episode. Don't forget that. They never let Betty interact with anyone. They never let Betty have a sense of character. And so in a show like Desperate Housewives that relies so heavily on fleshing out and stepping outside the boxes of these different archetypes, not letting Betty have any room at all, and instead just sticking this Black family into a bunch of literary stereotypes, it's not a good storyline. Um, now the acting, fantastic. I hold absolutely nothing against any of these actors. It is not their fault. They showed up, they did their job, they did great. Um, Alfre Woodard, incredible. And it's really unfortunate that such a talented actor got such a shit show of a storyline and that she was not utilized again after season two. So that kind of summarizes my complex feelings about the Applewhite storyline um, in season two. There are dramaturgical things to think about um, and how it fits into the story and that also has to be balanced with the way that the story lives and breathes. Um, their race is a part of that. And whether it was intentional by the writers or not, it does not leave a good taste in my mouth. Um, nor to many, many, many fans of the show who stopped watching entirely in season two because it's just too unbearable to watch. And it's disappointing to see these harmful tropes being used over and over and over. Um, I'm going to try and leave a handful of helpful resources on this and related subject matters in the description. So if you're up for some scholarship and some, you know, think pieces and some media criticism um, about these and similar tropes and the way that different genres balance the, the um, two things, then be sure to check out the links. Um, yeah. All right, we are going to wrap up with Susan and Mike. Carl and Mike are fighting over Susan. Fucking love triangle. Mike mentions the ring, um, basically revealing to Susan that he plans to propose to her. Susan invites Mike to a romantic dinner where she plans to propose. I think this is cute. I'm gonna give Susan a dub for this one. So we have two season dubs in the whole series now. We have a dub for Susan, when um right now and a dub for susan when she called gabby out for sleeping with a minor good job susan you have two <laughs> two thumbs up to your name susan tells carl that she will not accept the house because she knows that he has ulterior motives i.e trying to get susan to get back together with him in this episode mike goes to orson um reminder this is orson he's a dentist susan met him few episodes ago, Mike goes to Orson to get a chipped tooth fixed, and Orson asks if he's ever been to prison. Um, he can tell by his teeth. And Mike tells Orson he had a feeling in the movie theater that they had seen each other before. Um, Orson says he doesn't think so, though. Mike is going to his car. He's going to go see Susan. He just picked up some flowers, and he has the ring in his pocket. He's going to propose. A car comes out of nowhere, hits Mike. Speeds off, we see the man behind the wheel is none other than Orson Hodge. And that's the end of season two. We did it. Uh, I'm so happy we got through it. Overall thoughts on season two. I'm going to make this fast because I only have four minutes left on my SD card. I love you, Brie Vanda Camp. George deserved an even worse death. It should have been, oh, so gnarly, but at least he's gone. I'm glad I burnt that photo too. Alfre Woodard deserved better.
Nora, she's coming. Mother has arrived. This is a shit show, but Evil Longoria had some killer moments as Gabby. So I'm going to give credit where credit is due. Um, what else? Felicia Tillman being a silly bean brings me joy. So overall, there is plenty to enjoy in the season. The main mystery, though, definitely a huge letdown for the reasons that I have discussed all video long. We are ready to head into season three. I feel satisfied with season two. I will see you with an updated wall for season three.